I'm Carrie Kanoski, and welcome to this month's edition of Kidney Cancer News. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. The outline of my presentation is as follows. I will start with a short introduction on sunitinib for the treatment of advanced renal cell cancer. Thereafter, my presentation will be focused on the potential role of genetic polymorphisms in personalized medicine. In particular, I will discuss the role of genetic polymorphisms for the prediction of efficacy and toxicity of sunitinib treatment in patients with metastatic renal cell cancer. In 2006, Sunitinib has been approved for the treatment of advanced renal cell cancer, and currently, Sunitinib is the most widely prescribed drug for this disease. However, about one-third of patients experience progressive disease and do not benefit from Sunitinib treatment. In addition, Sunitinib treatment is associated with a wide range of toxic toxicities. Therefore, pre-treatment markers are needed to identify MRCC patients who will benefit from Sunitinib treatment and who will not. Pharmacogenetics may be useful for this purpose, as pharmacogenetics investigates the relationship between genetic polymorphisms and response to treatment, as well as drug-related toxicities. In particular, single nucleotide polymorphisms may be useful for personalized treatment planning in patients with MRCC. As Dr. Heng already pointed out, a single nucleotide polymorphism is a variation within a DNA sequence. The DNA code is specified before nucleotide letters, A, T, C, and G. A SNP variation occurs when a single nucleotide is replaced by one of the other three nucleotide letters. In this example, the DNA molecule below differs from the DNA molecule above at the single base pair location. This represents a CT polymorphism. Although single nucleotide polymorphisms do not result in physical changes nor affect uh, the production of proteins, it's believed that other single nucleotide polymorphisms may predispose to disease or may even influence response to drugs. In case of sunitinib, the efficacy of, and toxicity of sunitinib is determined by pharmacokinetic factors. After oral administration, sunitinib is absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract, for which the efflux transporters ABCB1 and ABCG2 may be important. In addition, CYP3A4 is an important enzyme for the biotransformation of sunitinib. CYP3A4 is expressed in the liver, and its expression is regulated by the nuclear receptors NR1I2 and NR1I3. In addition, other CYP enzymes, CYP3A5, CYP1A1, and CYP1A2, may be involved in the metabolism of sunitinib. Besides pharmacokinetic factors, pharmacodynamic factors regulate the efficacy and toxic toxicity of sunitinib. Important factors of sunitinib include the vascular endothelial growth factor receptors, the platelet-derived growth factor receptors, and FLIT3. In case of RCC, inhibition of VGFR by sunitinib is an important mechanism as it results in the inhibition of mitosis. Considering these pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic factors, we, we decided to investigate single nucleotide polymorphisms in these factors. The selected single nucleotide polymorphisms are depicted in green. Of note, we could not investigate genetic polymorphisms in CYP3A4, as no functional polymorphisms have been identified yet. The objectives of our studies were to identify genetic polymorphisms that are associated with a prolonged progression-free and or overall survival in sunitinib-treated MRCC patients. In addition, we investigated the correlation between genetic polymorphisms and sunitinib-induced to toxicities, as well as hypertension that develops during sunitinib treatments. For these studies, patients treated with sunitinib were recruited from six Dutch medical centers. For the efficacy analysis, 136 sunitinib-treated patients with clear cell histology were included. For the toxicity analysis, 219 sunitinib-treated patients with various malignancies were selected. And for the hypertension analysis, the cohort was extended to 291 sunitinib-treated patients with various malignancies. Of all patients, germline DNA was isolated from blood samples, and a total of three, uh, 37 um, polymorphisms in 50, 50 candidate genes were analyzed. For the efficacy analysis, progression-free and overall su survival were determined, and the toxicity was graded according to the CTC guidelines version 3. Starting with the efficacy analysis, we performed multivariate analysis for progression-free survival in 136 patients with clear cell histology. 
Among the clinical characteristics, the MSKCC risk factors, the number of metastatic sites in age were associated with progression-free survival. Among the genetic polymorphisms, polymorphisms in CYP3A5, the NR1I3 haplotype, and the ABCB1 haplotype were associated with an improved progression-free survival. We also performed multivariate analysis for overall survival. And among the clinical characteristics, the MSKCC risk factors were the only clinical characteristics that were associated with overall survival. In addition, the presence of an A allele in the VGFR2 gene was associated with an improved overall survival in these patients. Going back to the results for progression-free survival, we were able to define a favorable genetic profile. Patients were carriers of the favorable genetic profile if they had at least an A allele in the CYP3A5 gene, or a missing CAT copy in the NR1I3 haplotype, or a TCG copy in the ABCB1 haplotype. 95 out of 136 patients were carriers of the favorable genetic profile. When carriers were compared to non-carriers, carriers appeared to have an improved progression-free and overall survival. This was 13 versus 7 months for progression-free survival and 19 versus 12 months for overall survival. In multivariate analysis, the favorable genetic profile was still associated with an improved progression-free survival and showed a trend for overall survival. To the left, the survival curves for progression-free survival are presented and to the right, the curves for overall survival. The genetic polymorphisms that were investigated for relation with efficacy were also investigated for relation with snitnip induced toxicity. Previously, Van Erp et al. have shown that genetic polymorphisms are associated with snitnip induced toxicity in 219 patients with various malignancies. In that study, genetic polymorphisms in CYP1A1, FLIT3, and the NR1I3 haplotype were associated with the development of leukopenia. In addition, genetic polymorphisms in CYP1A1 were associated with the development of mucosal inflammation, and the presence of a TTT copy in the ABCB1 haplotype was associated with an increased risk of hand-foot syndrome. Finally, genetic polymorphisms in VGFR2 and the ABCG2 haplotype were associated with the development of any toxicity higher than grade 2. Among sunitinib induced toxicities, hypertension is a common reported side effect. However, the mechanism by which sunitinib induces hypertension has not been clarified yet. Previous studies have shown that VGFR2 is an important factor in the regulation of the vascular tone. Activation of VGFR2 by, its, by PI3 kinase and its downstream act stimulates endothelium derived nitric oxide synthase, leading to the production of the potent vasodilator nitric oxide. Nitric oxide itself is able to inhibit the production and activity of endothelin-1, which is a vasoconstrictor. But when the bioavailability of nitric oxide decreases, the activity and production of endothelin-1 increases, leading to vasoconstriction. It can be hypothesized that inhibition of VGFR2 by sunitinib results in an imbalance between vasodilation and vasoconstriction, leading to the development of hypertension. Considering these factors in the regulation of the vascular tone, we investigated polymorphisms in VEG, VEGF, VEGFR2, ENOS, and endothelin-1. In that study, 291 patients treated with sunitinib and with various malignancies were included, and we found that single nucleotide polymorphisms in VEGF and NOS3 were associated with the development of grade 3 hypertension during the first treatment cycle. In conclusion, our studies show that pharmacokinetic, but not pharmacodynamic polymorphisms are independent predictor factors of progression-free survival in sunitinib-treated MRCC patients. In addition, polymorphisms in genes encoding for metabolizing enzymes, efflux transporters, and drug targets are associated with sunitinib-related toxicities. And genetic polymorphisms in VEGF and NOS3 independently predict development of grade 3 hypertension during the first treatment cycle of sunitinib. These results show that genetic polymorphisms are promising for the prediction of the efficacy and toxicity of sunitinib in patients with MRCC. And these studies indicate that prospective studies are needed to validate the clinical value of genetic polymorphisms for individualized treatment planning in patients with metastatic renal cell cancer. And with this, I would like to end, and I would like to thank all patients and investigators who participated in this stu these studies.
Well, I'm currently 25. I live in New York with my family, and I'm um, about, about an hour and 15 minutes north of New York City in uh, Westchester County. I, I'm a still a student. I actually graduate in about two weeks. I'm an applied psychology major, and it'll be for my undergraduate degree, but I'm looking forward to finishing very much. Um, at the time, I was 23 years old. It was um, the fall of 2009. Early October, I was working with um, a development and disabled girl respite hours at her home as a eliciting the appropriate social behaviors, so to speak, and I was I would take her out into the community and do things with her. And she was very heavy and she had um, a lot of atrophy on one side of her body, so I'd have to pick her up a lot. And in doing so, I got a bulge disc in my spine. I went to a um, an orthopedist because I, I, I just felt shooting pains in my back and in my legs and it was you know the same old thing that I always feel with most people when they go to the doctor they go okay well here's some anti-inflammatories and here's some painkillers see me in two weeks if it still hurts (laughs) so that's what I did and I saw him back in two weeks his name was um, Dr. Daniel Southern in Ridgefield Connecticut and he said okay well you know if the pain is still here let's get an MRI and I said okay good that's good, that's great, because I don't, you know, this pain is not going away, and it was awful. So then I went to get the MRI, and then it took about a couple of, couple of days to get that back. And I came to meet with him in his office with my mother at the time. And he said, yeah, you know, the MRI does confirm you have a bulge disc in your lower spine. And I said, okay, great. And then we talked about how we would fix that with um, either oral prednisone or an epidural into the lower spine, into the disc. And that went that went well, and that, that was taken care of, and we had the whole discussion about how I was going to recuperate from that and what I needed to do for my back and you know, being a little more proactive about how I'm lifting people and things along those lines. And um, from there on, I was about to actually get up and leave the office that day, and he had said, no, would you just mind sitting back down? I wanted to share something with you that I had also seen on your MRI. And I said, okay, sure with my mother there and he said okay he said when I looked at your MRI he said these are your kidneys and I said okay you know I don't know what an MRI I can't read an MRI I have no knowledge of that whatsoever and he said this is what normal kidneys look like and I said okay you know looking at it and then he showed me what mine looked like and in my right kidney he said you see this part and he said it's really dark shadow (laughs) rather big and he's like, I would, I would like to you to go see a urologist to just follow up. He's like, I'm sure it's just a cyst or, or a kidney stone or something like that. He said, nothing to worry about. When I left that office that day, and it sounds silly to say it, but I just think that intuition told me that it's not going to be a good, good outcome. And then maybe I'm sure you can relate to that. Um, and from, from there, I went to go see a urologist in Danbury, Connecticut, named Dr. Broder who sent me to get a CT scan and an ultrasound. And that whole process with Dr. Broder took about mm, a month and a half or so, towards the end of October through most of November. And when he had concluded of doing the CT scans and the, the ultrasounds, he said, you know, he's like, it just... He's like, it can't really be cancer. You're, you know, you're 23 years old. You're a healthy female. There's, you have no predisposition to it. No one in your family has ever had kidney cancer. He's like, I'm really leaning towards an abscess cyst. He said that his uh, the urologist in his department had gotten together and discussed my case and said that that's what it was. And and, and he found it very convincing. And that day, specifically, my mother and my father were there with me, and. The way he had said it just wasn't enough for me. <laughs> he kind of looked at me and just said, I'm 98.9% positive it's not cancer. And I, as snippy as it sounds, came back and said, but you can't tell me that it's not, right? And he said, well, no. And I said, okay, well, then I would really like a referral. So from there, I went to go see um, Dr. John Kohlberg at Yale Urology in New Haven, Connecticut. And I had met with him several times and at first I think that he kind of also dismissed my case saying you know it doesn't really look like it It was grayish and black there was really no definitive answer and then one day I was sitting in his office again this was the fourth or fifth time that I had seen him because I was so adamant about wanting an answer because it had taken so long so far with, with with no response as to what was really going on 
and he he started listing symptoms and asking me if he if I could recall having any of them. And the one that struck me the most when he was reading through different various symptoms was that I remembered having terrible night sweats that summer, the summer of 2009, all the way through the fall, and thinking, I'm like, you know, I always would sweat through my sheets. And my mom and my dad would always say, oh, it's hormones, you're hormonal, you're a female, you're 23 years old, and we would dismiss it. But when I told that to Dr. Kohlberg, everything changed (laughs) that day. He wanted to do a biopsy that week. So I went and had a biopsy at Yale, and about five days later, he said, just call the office, we'll have the results, and we're absolutely going to know what's going on at this point. And I said, okay, great. You know, finally, I'd get some answers. However, I would call every day. I still remember his secretary's name is Lucille, because I would call her every day after the five-day period of when those results should have been in. And every day she said, oh, Jessica, they're still testing them. They're still testing them. Don't worry. You know, we'll get it. We'll, we'll call you. And I said, okay. But I would be persistent and call her every day. I think at, <laughs> at one point she was terribly annoyed with me because I would call her multiple times a day because then it, it was about three weeks later in that grace period of, you know, the five days. And on one day I called her. This was like mid-December, about December 18th or so of 2009, and she said, oh, Jessica, they, your slides were sent out for confirmation to Sloan Memorial in New York City. And I said, oh, okay, great. And as, I, as naive as this is going to sound, I didn't even know about Sloan Memorial Hospital. So when I looked it up on the Internet, it said Sloan Memorial, you know, Cancer Hospital. And I said, oh, <laughs> well, then that's really what it must be, which, you know, it's, I had always felt that that's what it was going to be, but no one... I think wanted to say that to me. No one wanted to sit, put themselves out there to say that a 22-year-old, perfectly healthy female with no previous hi- medical history at all has cancer. And um, on December 21st, 2009, Dr. Kohlberg called me. I was actually walking into a um, math statistics final at my university. And he told me that it was confirmed that I had papillary renal cell carcinoma type 1. You know, people ask me all the time, like, how that, the story of it happening, how they even found it, because the odds of it, and Dr. Kohlberg had told me the odds of them ever having found it wouldn't have been until it was way later hadn't I gotten hurt. And it was also interesting for multiple other reasons that my, my tumor was inside embedded right into my urinary tract or or urinary ducts in the kidney itself. It was inside and not on the outside of the kidney. So that that is, to my understanding, that is why they had suggested that it had been an abscessed cyst and so forth or a benign tumor of some sort. You can never pronounce the name of the one they always talked about. (laughs) Angela Pylonoma, I don't really know how to say it, but I know that they always, they kept saying that it was probably that. But it all changed when I had gone over that I had night sweats with him. Um, I had surgery December 30th, 2009. I was in the hospital for seven days. I was there for a week. We had decided it was my decision. Um, well, sort of my decision. We, I knew that I was going to have to have it removed. Um, but it was either a decision between a full nephrectomy or a partial nephrectomy, you know, removing the kidney. And to my knowledge as well, at the time... There was no doctor who was willing to do this laparoscopically because of the where my tumor was in my kidney. And it, quite honestly, was mortifying and probably one of the most terrifying experiences of my life to date. And I think that most people have been through quite a lot, whether it's medical or anything in your life. And this was the most terrifying experience. I also had an extreme phobia of needles. So th- even thinking about someone cutting me open and removing a part of my body was just absolutely horrifying. So <clears throat> I went in for surgery December 30th, and I was there for five days. I, I woke up out of surgery, and it had felt like someone had taken a saw blade to the side of my body like they were cutting down a tree. It was just an awful excruciating pain. I've never felt anything like that in my life, but I think that it makes me a stronger person now, looking back. 
But I didn't get up the first day. I wouldn't get out of the bed. And partially also because I found out that I was allergic to morphine. <laughs> and I couldn't breathe when I woke up right away. I was on oxygen for a few days. And I had hives and I was very swollen. But, you know, and then I was put on, um, oh, I'm going to forget the name of the pain medication, but I was on that for the entirety of my stay there. And I didn't get out of bed till about day three. I had sat up on the second day, but it was just, I, I, I can't, it's like I just can't even describe the pain. It's unbelievable. And then after my seven days, I also spent New Year's Eve in the hospital um, that year. I, I went home. My parents took me home, and I didn't leave my house for about six weeks. According to what my doctor had wanted me to do, he said that I would not feel comfortable in a car. And I had a, I was <laughs> I had such cabin fever because all I wanted to do was leave the house. But, you know, you can hardly sit up. You can hardly get out of bed. It took me about three weeks. I, I stayed in the guest room in my family's house because I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs because it was just too painful. But after about six weeks, I had gone back to let him look at my scar and how it was healing and it um, it looked fine. It looked great. I mean, other than the fact that I'll have this, you know, six to eight inch scar on the body for the rest of my life, I think that I'm fine. I'm perfectly healthy now. It's just, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's such a difficult memory to talk about, but a very positive one, too, because it only makes anyone who's dealt with it or is dealing with it that much stronger. I think that it has made me an incredibly strong individual. I was never, I wasn't a weak person prior. I always found myself to be a strong person, an outgoing person, a leader in some ways. And after this happened, I think for the first year afterwards, I was, I was distraught. I felt like, you know, why me? And it was a very self-pitying um, attitude. And I was never that person. And my mom would talk to me. She was the biggest, and my father, my mother and my father and my brother and sister have been the most supporting people. Without them, I don't know where I would be, especially my mother and father. They would support me like no other. And I think that it was through what they would tell me and, you know, that nothing, if I could beat this, that I could do anything. And, you know, you grow up and you hear people tell you that, that you can do anything in life. And if you can do this, you'll be a stronger person for this. Having this experience, having gone through this experience, I am such a strong person now. I don't let things get to me like they used to. And if they do, I have to remind myself where I've been and where I am. And I think that it really has impacted my life in a weird way for the better, to be a better person. If I could say this bluntly, I would say to keep your head up and to realize that today sucks, <laughs> tomorrow might be worse, the following few months might be even worse than the day that you had today. But if you can get through this and if you can keep your head up and realize that there are people who love you and support you and that you're not alone and that there are so many other people out there who are dealing with what you're dealing with, that you can, you can push through it. You can realize that there's more to life than letting something like this trying to ruin it. And that's what I've gotten personally from my own experience. And that's the best advice I could give anyone is that kidney cancer sucks. The experience is not wonderful, but if you can get through it, you're going to be a very strong person. And you're going to love yourself even more. Join us again next month for another edition of Kidney Cancer News. I'm Carrie Kanoski, wishing you good health.